of NVIDIA, Jensen Huang. talk about self-driving cars today. Last year, we introduced the DrivePX self-driving car computer, and I said three things. I said that in the future, when you build cars, it's going to be a lot more like a computer. But the ability for car companies and uh, system OEMs to configure cars by connecting sensors and controllers one at a time and evolve it over time is going to be more and more difficult. You have to approach it from a computing system perspective. Software is going to be a very big part of what you do. And ongoing improvements of the software is going to be very important. And it's designed to make it possible for us to realize the vision of self-driving cars. It has 12 CPU cores, four chips, each with Pascal GPUs in it, with a combined processing capability of eight teraflops, with a special new instruction design, new set of instructions designed for deep learning that makes it possible for us to achieve 24 deep learning teraflops per second. It's built with 16 nanometer fin fat. All together, this entire supercomputer fits in your trunk very nicely, the size of a lunchbox. 250 watts, all in that little tiny device. The co computational capability of PX2 is equivalent to essentially 150 MacBook Pros. Imagine 150 MacBook Pros of processing capability in your trunk. All of this within the size of a school lunchbox, 250 watts. It needs to be water cooled. And the reason why it needs to be water cooled is because we want to be able to make it possible for you to uh, have this operate in all kinds of severe conditions that a car could be enjoying. Okay, so NVIDIA Drive PX2 uh, is uh, uh, painted over uh, from a new lane, and all of a sudden, the number of lanes that you look at with your car is rather confusing for the car. And so everything around that environment is chaotic. It's complex, it's unpredictable, and oftentimes it's even hazardous. So self-driving cars are hard. The biggest problem at the core of it is perception. The biggest problem is perception. First of all, what is happening around me? What are things that I should be concerned about? And how should the car deal with it? The perception problem is at the core a very difficult problem. Well, as it turns out, the moment of Shazam, the Shazam moment, came several years ago. Computer scientists have been trying to fi figure this problem out for a long time. And several simultaneous innovations happened in the early part of this decade that made it possible for us to imagine solving this problem for the very first time. Work that was done by Jeff Hinton at the University of Toronto, Jan LeCun, Andrew Eng at Stanford, you know, Jan was a New York University, work that they were doing independently um, on artificial intelligence networks came together to solve this problem in a really, really huge way. Yamaka's convolution neural net, which makes it possible for programs to detect important features by itself if you gave it enough images, able to accelerate the work that is done all over the world around deep learning and AI. Today, these are the frameworks that are offered around the world. Every single one of them are accelerated by CUDA GPUs. By using NVIDIA's GPUs, we can accelerate the training process of deep learning by some 20, 30, 40 times. What otherwise would have taken months to train now can be done in days. And we can, therefore, create faster networks, better networks, more robust networks, and use it for more things. The number of applications that we're seeing around the world as a result of this movement is really quite utterly staggering. If you haven't had a initial learning in the network, and so we, we can retarget to a multi-class um, data set. So this is an upcoming data set that will be publicly available soon. It's a cityscape data set that was developed with Daimler. So uh, there's more training images, and they're very, very finely segmented and detailed. It's a very modern data set. 
So we took that same network that we used for the kitty data set and pulled in this data and, and retrained. And because we can retrain so fast, we're able to iterate very quickly to end up tweaking sort of the algorithms and how we set up the neural network and exactly how we train to get these types of results. So we train for five different classes here. So pedestrians, street lights. Now one engineer coded something to detect a man walking across the street in a suit. That's right. It's, that's Two it's, ladies walking down the street. Not one feature detector was coded by him. Correct. We, it's basically like holding up millions and millions of flashcards to, to the computer and telling it to learn and basically nudging it in the right direction when it gets things wrong. So besides even the classes, we also had to train the, the tightness of the, of the bounding box as well. So this, this is all work in progress and it was, done, it was done very, very quickly. But as you said, because we're not having 300 engineers sit there and hand code features, we can turn around experiments so fast. Basically, you're now using compute time, which is relatively cheap compared to engineering time in order to do these experiments. Quickly, you can turn things around. So in this particular case, not only are you detecting a car, you're detecting all of the pixels that are associated with a car. Right. So where this gets important is you think about needing to calculate free space in the scene. So it's sort of like if you ask a child to take a crayon and say, color the road. Color things I can drive on. Okay, color the people. Color, color the cars. And so this gives you the next level of perception, saying, well, you know, what can I drive on? What is this thing at this pixel that, that I'm looking at? So it's a much more robust way to handle perception in a car. In a practical solution, you're going to combine all these techniques. And this is, this is still the same core network. We taught it to recognize one thing, and then we taught it to recognize more than one thing, and then now we're, we're teaching it to recognize which pixel associates with what thing. That's right. So, so once you can train... Uh, so we're using these four LiDARs. Uh, they're quarter G LiDARs, right? They're, they're 40,000 samples per, per scan, and we're scanning them 10, 10 times a second. So four, four LiDARs, that represents about 1.6 million samples. We have six cameras, each one megapixel. Uh, as, as you've already said, and we're, and we're of course updating those at 30 frames a second. Now, we chose this configuration of sensors. We chose this configuration of sensors so that we could test out the entire platform for self-driving cars. Now, there's a lot of different configurations you can imagine. You could imagine, you know, um, sweeping singular LiDAR systems. Uh, you've you've uh, you probably even heard there there are different LiDAR systems that could be maybe four different LiDARs that are oriented in different, uh, different uh, angles so that uh, it could remove self-shadowing and... and um, uh, so what I'm going to show you is, uh, to be able to show some results here, um, we recorded um, the sensor um, output uh, to disk and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to be replaying the sensor while I'm going to be running all the algorithms live in a computer. Um, so here you can see what the, um, what the data looks like. This is a recording uh, taken in um, um, Abit Samkara. Uh, this is a one-on-one -on -one, uh, freeway drive. And, and you know, I just remember for the audience, Miguel's currently not driving. He's actually in the back sitting next yeah. to the workstation. And so the video is streaming into the computer. However, the processing of this video is all being done in real time. Okay, so the processing is all being done in real time. The video has all been pre-recorded, streaming in. Okay, go ahead. That's correct. So, so now you, you can see here the video. Let me show you also the uh, LiDAR uh, data. So this is four LiDARs, and what you see here is the accumulation of all the uh, measurements that the LiDARs are taking. We can you know, turn some of them off, so you can see this is front LiDAR, the front roof LiDAR. As I mentioned earlier, we have two, uh, two narrow field view cameras, one in front, one in the back. We are running drive on those cameras. We are just taking those um, those images in and running them through a network network that's been trained to recognize cars, um, different classes of cars, like cars, SUVs, uh, buses, and, and such. And we are running that um, as you know in, in, in parallel with um, with the rest of the algorithms. Now, um, the second part of the auto detection we do is we look at that occupancy map that we were discussing earlier, we detect the moving objects in the map, and then with those, uh, because the, the, this, uh, um, the grid that we have here is, um, is more coordinates, we can then establish positions of objects, let me pause it, it's positions of objects, relative speed to, uh, to our car, and because we have the neural network that tells us what those objects are, then we can um, also uh, put a class to them, and then 
understand what those things are as they move uh, by amps. The point that you're trying to make is that GPS just simply is not good enough. That is correct. Right? GPS is accurate within several meters, but we need accuracy within several centimeters. Exactly, that's correct. Now, in addition to um, just this uh, the localization, we are also running um, a simplified path planner that allows us to figure out um, you know, the current lane, whether it's, it's viable to be drive, uh, driven in, or whether we need to switch lanes and how, what sort of trajectory we kind of should, uh, should follow to do that. As you can see here, um, the path planner is just fine. It's just giving us the current lane in green because that is drivable, and then alternate lane changes. Now, as we, as obstacles, as other cars are driving by us, we can see that um, we're trying to estimate that path, and we see that there's an obstacle, so there's a bunch of paths that are not valid. Now, 101 with the vehicles passing, all of this is being computed in real time. This is not a video down below. This is Look at that, it just changed lanes. The car in front of it just changed lanes. Two cars just come up next to us. We don't need rear view mirrors anymore. <laughs> there's no reason to ever have to look around you. Yeah, you can uh, just loop there as well. Right and because our, our sensors are, are so robust and because we have so many redundant sensors, it is possible for us to detect all of these different cars around us with a great deal of confidence. Yeah, very, very cool. And uh, another thing you can see is uh, the accuracy of the location. So up in the video, you see the off-ramp. You can see exactly the off-ramp happening here digitally. So we're placed very precisely inside of the lanes. Okay. So drive PX, doing all the sensor fusion, all the perception with deep learning, localization algorithms, path planning, essentially performing all of the computation on a supercomputer necessary for self-driving, sends the information to the drive CX, which is now being displayed uh, in real time so that the driver has great confidence that the car sees what they see, and the car is taking actions that are consistent with the path that they should take. Really great work. Thanks, Justin.